Good evening. My name is Emily Underwood. I'm with the Missouri Historical Society. Thank you so much for your patience with us this evening. We were having a few technical glitches behind the scenes and I appreciate your patience as we dealt with those. Um, I do wanna welcome you on behalf of the Missouri Historical Society and thank you for joining us virtually this evening for STL History Live. Safety is a top priority, so nearly all of our programming is virtual right now, but the museum is open a Wednesday through Sunday with several safety precautions in place. We would love for you to visit if you feel safe. Advanced reservations are required to visit all of the Missouri Historical Society locations, including the History Museum, Soldiers Memorial, and the Library and Research Center. And you can visit mohistory.org to plan your visit and reserve free tickets. Tonight's program, Suffrage at 100, Women's Rights, Civil Rights, and Voting Rights from 1920 to COVID-19, presented with the University of Missouri-St. Louis as part of the annual James Neal Prim Lecture in History, is presented in conjunction with the newest exhibit at the Missouri History Museum, Beyond the Ballot, St. Louis and Suffrage, presented by Wells Fargo. So I wanna thank Wells Fargo for their support of the exhibit, as well as Emerson, who is our education sponsor. And I also wanna thank the University of Missouri-St. Louis for bringing us this wonderful program tonight with Dr. Liette Gidlow. I also want to thank all of the Missouri Historical Society members who may be tuned in this evening, and even if you're not tuned in. Um, if you're not a member yet, we would love for you to consider joining today, and you'll be able to find a link for more information about membership in the chat box. I'll post that in a minute or two. We also want to thank all of you in St. Louis City and County for your tax contributions through the Zoo Museum Tax District. And last but not least, I do wanna give a thanks um, to all the members of the Harvard Club who have tuned in tonight. We are so glad to have you with us, so thank you. Before we get started, uh, there are a few things you'll wanna know. This is going to be roughly a 30 to 40 minute presentation. And then after that, Professor Andrew Hurley will lead a Q&A. So please feel free to submit any questions you have through our Q&A feature, and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. We do have live captioning available for you this evening, so if you um, want to use that, you can select to turn that on through your toolbar. And if you want to go back and watch this program at any time or share it out with friends and family, um, you will be able to find it on the Missouri Historical Society YouTube channel where it will be posted by early next week. And finally, your feedback is always important to us. So we are asking you to take a minute or two to fill out a very short survey um, that will open in another tab in your browser. And we thank you in advance for that if you'll do that at the end of the program tonight. So as I mentioned before, this program is connected to our new exhibit, Beyond the Ballot, St. Louis and Suffrage, which opened on August 1st. And we are so proud of this remarkable opportunity to spotlight the story of women in our region. We know that 1920 is not where the story of suffrage ends, and it isn't where it began either. And Dr. Gidlow's presentation is gonna take us from 1920 through the years up to the present day. And our Beyond the Ballot exhibit almost does the converse of that, looking back um, before 1920 to learn about the women who used their voices and made an impact on our community before they had access to the vote. Some of these women are people you may be very familiar with, and others are going to be names that really have not been celebrated here in St. Louis, despite the lasting legacies that they have created. So we do hope that you'll come visit the exhibit. We are certainly looking forward to having live programming back in our building at some point in the future. Um, but in the meantime, we really are so pleased to be able to bring you these virtual programs that offer us a chance to think more deeply and honestly, um, not only about the history of suffrage, but women's movements more generally, and to expand the narrative to include the stories of Black women and other women of color. I want to thank once again the University of Missouri-St. Louis for their continued collaboration with us in presenting the James Neal Prim History Lecture, and um, always bringing us such interesting and relevant scholarship year after year. And at this point, I'm going to turn the screen over. I'll stop my screen share, and I'm going to turn it over to Chancellor Kristen Sobelik, who's gonna say a few words to you and introduce our speaker this evening. So thank you. And Kristen, oh, I think I have to help you get your screen back on. There we go. Great, hello everybody. <laughs> so good evening. My name is Kristen Sobelik, Chancellor of the University of Missouri, St. Louis. And I am delighted that you are joining us tonight for the annual James Neal Prim Lecture in History. 
This speaker series, as you heard, was created many years ago in honor of Dr. Neil Prim, an internationally acclaimed historian who helped build the early academic reputation of this university. I want to acknowledge and thank his daughter, Jackie Termini, who contributes to the success of this lecture every year. This series annually brings distinguished historians to St. Louis to share their current research and works. That's certainly the case tonight. Our speaker, Dr. Liette Gidlow, is an associate professor of history at Wayne State University, where she specializes in 20th century politics and women's and gender history. She has published two books so far. The first is titled The Big Vote, which analyzes how massive nonpartisan voter turnout campaigns in the 1920s helped to contain the radical potential of women's suffrage by establishing new norms of expert citizenship and consumer citizenship. Her second book is Obama Clinton Palin, a collection of essays by top ranking historians that takes the long view on the historic 2008 presidential election. Currently, Professor Gidlow is working on another book titled The 19th Amendment and the Politics of Race, 1920 to 1970, which uncovers connections between the 19th Amendment of 1920 and the Black freedom movements of the 1950s and 1960s, thus bringing into conversation two historical narratives that previously have been treated separately. Tonight, she will share some of that research in her talk titled Suffrage at 100, Women's Rights, Civil Rights, and Voting Rights from 1920 to COVID-19. This is an especially topical issue at the University of Missouri-St. Louis, where more than half of our full-time faculty are women, a rare fact even in 2020. Gender equity, any movement for equity, is a long, hard process that must be supported from bottom to top. And I can assure you, there's a lot of pushing and shoving along the way. Creating and maintaining a culture for inclusive excellence is a pillar of the University of Missouri-St. Louis's strategic plan. And I am very proud of UMSL's efforts and its culture, but I am also quite aware of the ongoing struggle required to achieve equity across the board. I, like you, look forward to Professor Gidlow's insights into the past and ongoing struggles of equity in voting and other facets of our life. So with that, I turn it over to Professor Gidlow. Thank you so much, Chancellor, for that generous introduction. Good evening and welcome to uh, the programming tonight. I'd like to thank uh, the Missouri Historical Museum for this opportunity to talk about suffrage in the context of the early 21st century. And I'd like to thank UMSL, and in particular, Andrew Hurley and Laura Westhoff for their generous invitation to present tonight. I would like to uh, take a moment to take us in mind back to Nashville, Tennessee in the summer of 1920. It was a sweltering August afternoon when generations seemed to, uh, when generations, when the struggle of generations to enfranchise women on the same terms as men seemed to come to a triumphant end. 72 years earlier, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott and their intrepid peers had shocked polite society by demanding the right to vote and a raft of other rights for women. By 1920, every signer of their bold declaration of sentiments, save one, was dead. Women suffragists had persisted through countless trials and humiliations to get to that moment. They had spoken out, organized, petitioned, traveled, marched and raised funds. Some had also endured assault, jail, and starvation to advance the cause. When the Tennessee legislature voted that day to ratify the 19th Amendment, that right was finally won. Or was it? 
Missouri suffragists had certainly done their part to uh, advance the cause of woman suffrage. Beginning in the 1860s, Missouri women had petitioned the state legislature to pass a measure to enfranchise women in the state. Eight times, a house in the legislature brought measures to the vote. Eight times, those measures went down to defeat. Suffragists then asked the state's voters to extend the suffrage to women. But in 1914, a statewide ballot initiative was defeated by a margin of two to one. Missouri suffragists attracted national attention in 1916 when the Democratic National Committee held its national convention in St. Louis in that presidential election year. Thousands of suffragists assembled at 19th and Locust Street, positioning themselves between the hotels where the delegates were staying and the convention hall where the delegates were meeting. Each suffragist carried a bright yellow parasol. These ladies could hardly be missed. The suffragists said not a word as convention delegates walked down the street to get to the convention hall, but the presence of the suffragists said it all. Missouri women wanted the vote and they were watching to see whether party leaders and public officials would respond to their request. Missouri women succeeded in gaining presidential suffrage in 1919, but before they could even use it, the federal amendment brought full suffrage to women in the state. The 19th amendment officially eliminated sex as a barrier to voting throughout the US. It expanded voting rights to more people than any other single measure in American history. And yet the legacy of the 19th amendment in the short term and over the next century, it turned out to be complicated. The amendment advanced equality between the sexes, but left intersecting inequalities of race, class, and ethnicity intact. The amendment stimulated important policy changes, but left many reform goals unachieved. The amendment helped women, above all white women, find new footings in and in time, he'd run for president and yet left most women outside the halls of power. The 19th Amendment was hardly the end of the struggle for diverse women's equality. The 19th Amendment, however, was a step, a crucial step, but only a step in the continuing quest for more representative democracy. After ratification in Missouri as elsewhere, significant numbers of women still couldn't vote. Once ratification had been achieved, neither the general public nor professional politicians knew quite what to expect when election season arrived in the fall of 1920. Both suffragists and anti-suffragists, sometimes called antis, had promised big changes if the 19th Amendment became law. Any prediction was bound to be exaggerated, if only because women in 15 states already enjoyed full suffrage by state action. Suffragists had promised that women voters would clean up politics and enact a sweeping agenda of progressive reforms. Antis worried that the dirty business of politics would compromise women's moral standing, or that women who took part in public affairs might abandon their traditional responsibilities at home. Elections officials worried that polling places would be overwhelmed by the influx of new women voters. Election officials in Jersey City, New Jersey took no chances. They ordered new ballot boxes the size of flower barrels to hold all the votes. Nor was it clear how the new women voters would change the balance of political power. Republicans predicted that new women voters would choose the party of Lincoln to express their gratitude for passage of the suffrage amendment. Democrats countered that new women voters would choose them instead and perhaps even rescue the League of Nations from political death. 
or perhaps women would reject both major parties and organize into a party of their own, maximizing their power by voting as a bloc. New York City's political bosses at Tammany Hall worried, and here I'm quoting a local newspaper account, that wild women voters might send the great machine wobbling if they elected to vote independently rather than toe the party line. Still others predicted that women's suffrage would make no difference at all and believed that women would be intimidated by the complexities of voting or that they just weren't interested and they would simply stay home. When the election returns were tallied from that first election season, the impact of new women voters on the results defied simple description. Overall, fewer women voted than men, with female turnout averaging two thirds the rate of men. And yet the big picture obscured a great deal of variation at the state and local levels. Women's turnout varied from a high of 57% in Kentucky to a low of 6% in Virginia. The gap in turnout between the sexes ranged from 28% in Missouri to 40% in Connecticut. Everywhere, the particular political and legal context influenced the turnout rate. For all voters, turnout tended to be higher in states with competitive races or in localities with well-organized parties. In areas with lopsided contests or layers of voting restrictions, turnout generally lagged. Full suffrage also expanded the opportunities for women to seek elected office and shape public policy. Many women had run for office before the 19th Amendment, some 3,701 since the Civil War by one scholar's count. Still, the 19th Amendment spurred a number of female firsts. In Yonkala, Oregon, temperance-minded voters threw out the entire city council and replaced them with women candidates backed by the Women's Christian Temperance Union. The New York Times reported this event as a, quote, sex uprising in Yonkala. At least 22 women between 1920 and 1923 were elected mayor in small towns from Washington State to Georgia. Bertha Landis became the first female big city mayor when she was elected and served in Seattle in 1926. Women also ran standout races for federal office. Occasionally, they even won. Minnie Fisher Cunningham, pictured here, led Texas's successful campaign for women's suffrage in primary elections in 1918. In 1927, the future New Dealer ran for the US Senate. She lost the primary, but she threw her support to another candidate who squeaked out a win against the incumbent Democrat, an incumbent who was in the pocket of the Ku Klux Klan. And in 1928, the daughters of two of the nation's most powerful men of the previous generation, men who had worked on opposing sides in the storied presidential race of 1896, both won election to the US House of Representatives. Ruth Hannah McCormick was the daughter of William McKinley's campaign manager, Mark Hanna, and she won election from Illinois as a Republican. She advocated for prohibition, farmers' interests, and isolationism in her single term of service. Ruth Bryan Owen was the daughter of Cross of Gold orator William Jennings Bryan. She won election from Florida as a Democrat and earned praise for her advocacy of child welfare, as well as Florida's agricultural interests. Owen's father, the three-time Democratic nominee for president and three-time loser, might have smiled from beyond the grave at his daughter's accomplishment. Owen joked to the press about her win, saying, quote, there, I am the first Brian who ran for anything and got it. Political parties also found new roles for women with interests in politics. Women have participated in political parties well before enfranchisement. But in 1920, both the Republican and Democratic organizations 
created new positions for women. They showcased women at their national conventions, they placed women on party committees, and they created new women's divisions for the purpose of integrating new women voters into the party. A few exceptional women, such as Joplin born Emily Newell Blair, exerted unusual influence in political parties. Blair cut her teeth as a writer and editor, but became a great grassroots organizer for the Democratic Party after women won the vote. She traveled the country, established nearly 2,000 women's democratic clubs with the goal of cementing the loyalty of newly enfranchised women to the Democratic Party. By the late 1920s, she had left that work and became editor of Better Homes and Gardens. Newly enfranchised women also left their mark on public policy. After ratification, suffrage leaders forged an alliance to bring their collective political muscle to bear on the legislative process. Soon, 20 organizations, including the League of Women Voters, the National Women's Trade Union League, and the Women's Christian Temperance Union, banded together to form the Women's Joint Congressional Committee, or WJCC. Claiming to represent a combined membership of 20 million women, the WJCC advanced a legislative agenda that put women and children first. The WJCC's efforts produced real legislative gains. In 1920, Shepard Towner addressed the shocking rates of infant mortality uncovered in studies by social worker Julia Lathrop and the Children's Bureau and provided a million dollars a year to states to fund maternal and child health clinics. The Children's Bureau administered Shepherd Towner, adding a new division to do so, thereby expanding women's foothold in the executive branch. Shepherd Towner created a model for federal state partnerships that the architects of the New Deal would adopt in the next decade to address the deprivations of the depression. Women's lobbyists also succeeded in 1922 in winning congressional passage of the Cable Act. The Cable Act provided a path back to the voting booth for women who had lost their US citizenship by marrying a foreign national. Yes, after 1907, US born women who married a citizen of another nation lost their US citizenship without necessarily gaining the citizenship of their husbands many of them, in other words, being rendered stateless. Women activists enjoyed additional legislative successes at the state and local level. At the federal level, they tried without success to win reforms on other important Leah, your sound cut out just a little bit. Okay. Oh, now you're back. <laughs> okay. All right. In these ways, the 19th Amendment expanded opportunities for women to participate in governance and change the trajectory of social welfare policy. And yet, these developments fell far short of the promises made, both by suffragists and by antis. Suffragists had promised that voting women would propel a progressive juggernaut that would at last solve the nation's vast social problems. Antis had warned that voting women would sow chaos by abandoning their responsibilities at home. But where was this dramatic change, for good or for ill, that both supporters and opponents of women's suffrage had predicted? The impact of women's votes was limited because in the decade after ratification, the coalition that had supported suffrage splintered under the pressures of the troubled post-war political climate. Amid national tensions fueled by widespread labor unrest, bloody race riots, anti-immigrant animus, and anarchist violence, conservative women organized in the Daughters of the American Revolution and the Women's Auxiliary of the American Legion and accused many progressive women of harboring communist sympathies. 
These red baiting tactics soon brought the Shepherd Towner Act to an end. The measure had been opposed from the beginning by organized medicine. The AMA criticizing it as a quote, imported socialistic scheme. They succeeded in getting Congress to defund it by 1929. In other words, concerns over government backed healthcare and charges of socialized medicine go back a long way. Progressive suffragists also divided among themselves, above all over the possibility of an equal rights amendment. Suffragist Alice Paul insisted that a blanket amendment to ensure sex equality must be the next item on women's agenda. But other women who had labored for decades to secure wages and hours protections for working women did not want to risk the possibility that an equal rights amendment would undo their hard-won gains. Nor did women find that full suffrage necessarily gave them greater access to the levers of power. The Democratic and Republican parties had welcomed women with great fanfare in 1920, but the women's divisions into which they had channeled them lacked real power. The same was frequently true at the state level. A female member of the New Jersey Republican State Committee in 1924 noted regretfully that the state committee on which she sat rarely met and when it did passed here i quote her a few resolutions of no importance then the men met privately and transacted the real business full suffrage produced less change than suffragists had hoped and the antis had feared in part because women didn't vote as a block and indeed sometimes they didn't vote at all Establishment politicians soon learned that for the most part, they didn't need to worry about women voting because there was no such thing as the women's vote, meaning that ballots cast by women often increased the total, but rarely changed the outcome. And local variations aside, the overall turnout numbers for women voters were indisputably lower than those for men. This fact appalled former suffragists and seemed to validate the anti's claims that women never wanted the vote in the first place. Emily Newell Blair confronted the charges in a 1926 article she wrote for Harper's Magazine with a provocative title, Is Woman Suffrage a Failure? Suffragists were determined that woman suffrage would not be proved a flop. And in 1924, with the help of Blair, the League of Women Voters began massive campaigns of advertising and education to get out the vote, a program that by the end of the decade would evolve into the organization's main mission. Critics blame non-voting women for shirking their civic duty, but one could fairly ask just Leah, you cut yeah, out to party interest. There you are again. Sorry, you're back again. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm not sure what the problem is because I'm the only one on the internet here at home. Well, you, you sound fine now, so we'll keep rolling. Right. Great, thank you. States kept other barriers to voting for men and women alike intact or raised them higher still even after the 19th Amendment was ratified. Certainly this was a case for African-Americans in the Jim Crow South who aspired to vote. African-American men had been enfranchised after the Civil War and voted in great numbers throughout the South. But after Reconstruction, almost universally lost the freedom to cast ballots when white supremacists, aided by friendly courts, pushed back with literacy tests fraud, intimidation, and violence. After ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920, Southern African Americans surged to the polls. Not only did many Black women seek to use their new right, but many Black men, honorably discharged from service in the Great War, or wishing to accompany female family members, seized the moment to try to return to the polls themselves after decades of disfranchisement. For these women voters here, 
community was key. Snapped shortly after the nine subjects had registered to vote in the upcoming presidential election, this photo confounds the widespread assumption that after the 19th Amendment was ratified, Southern Black women stayed away from the polls. These voting women were connected not only by their shared experience of registering to vote, but also by their marital status, their labor, and their community of residence. At the time of the photo, none of the women were married. They all worked as professionals at the Virginia Normal and Industrial Institute, the land-grant college established in Virginia for Black students during segregation. Now it's Virginia State University. And all the women resided on campus on faculty row. These are among the few African-American women voters from the South in this period whose names we know. Mary Branch, in the front row on the far left, was 41 years old. Next to her stands Anna Lindsay, age 44, the first director of music at the college. Edna Colson, next to her, age 31, was a teacher and also the daughter of James Major Colson, Jr., who himself was a Dartmouth graduate and the second principal of the institute. Colson Hall, which still stands on the VSU campus today, is named for him. Next to her is Edna Wright, who is 30 years old and a native of Georgia. Janella Fraser, age 23, was hired as the Institute's first professor of piano. She brought with her a degree from Fisk University and experience as a Fisk Jubilee singer. Within the decade, she would marry Luther P. Jackson, a historian who in 1916 helped Carter G. Woodson found the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. The organization survives today as ASALA. In 1934, he would also found the League of Negro Voters in Petersburg, Virginia. Next to Fraser stands Nanny Nichols, born in Georgia, who was 27 years of age. In the back row on the left stands Eva Connor, age 26, from South Carolina, Avaya Carpenter, age 31, a teacher, and Beatrice Grine, age 24, a librarian at the college. These women were among the thousands who succeeded in casting ballots after the 19th Amendment was ratified. My research has identified large-scale collective mobilizations in Baltimore, Richmond, Atlanta, Jacksonville, Daytona, Shreveport, Mobile, Houston, and Galveston, Texas. These successes were not the norm, but they had significant consequences for election law, political parties, and social movements on the right and left. Though the women pictured here succeeded in registering and voting, most Southern African American women did not. More often, aspiring Black voters Put an extremely uncomfortable position. Caught off guard, white registrars sometimes permitted the first few applicants to succeed. When the women kept coming, officials improvised ways to turn them down. An Alabama County registrar said as much to political scientist Ralph Bunch when Bunch traveled through the South in the late 1930s doing research for the American Dilemma Project with Gunnar Myrdal. Quoting from his research notes, way back in 1920, the Alabama official recalled, we had a world of N-word women coming in to register. There was a dozen of them, I reckon, come in one registration period. We registered a few of them, and then we put them off, told them they had to bring in white witnesses told them how much poll tax it was going to cost. Permitting a few African Americans to register also allowed white supremacists to claim that they hadn't excluded on the basis of race at all, and that other applicants simply had failed to meet the standard of the qualified voter. Pressure from black women compelled elections officials to resort to other fraudulent tactics. When women in America's Georgia approached the county office, the registrar 
quote, would hide the book or himself. Elsewhere, women were given the runaround until the registration period ran out. In Hampton, Virginia, Mrs. Allen Washington complained that she and a friend had made repeated visits to the registrar's office, each time being told to return at a later date. On the last day of the registration period, they were simply refused, the clerk finally admitting to her as the clock ran out that, quote, to tell you the truth, we're not going to be bothered with a lot of colored women. In Fulton County, Georgia, registrar Lucian Harris suspended the registration of women altogether, claiming he needed to redeploy his staff to more pressing matters. In Muskogee, Oklahoma, when the registrar was approached by a group of African-American women, he panicked and resigned. White supremacists tried to block black voters from the polls, but their efforts at obstruction did not always work. When it failed, they sometimes turned to intimidation and violence. In November 1920, in the town of Oakway, Florida, voting by a single man, single black man, triggered a pogrom that reduced a whole community to ashes. A few miles west of Orlando, Oakway was home to about a thousand residents, a third of them African American. The Jacksonville Times Union blamed election day violence there on, quote, unregistered Negroes who demanded ballots, including a man reported elsewhere to be Mr. July Perry, an orchard supervisor and a registered Republican. Perry was reported to have threatened to return to the polls after being turned down, next time with his gun. But Alexander Ackerman, a Republican campaign official from Georgia who investigated the events afterwards, came to a different conclusion. Ackerman found instead that the situation in Okoy had been brewing for some time. He wrote to a Republican U.S. Senator that, quote, at Okoy, it was rumored for weeks in advance that not a single Negro would be permitted to vote. Ackerman believed that Perry tried to vote but left quietly when he was turned down and that the violence started when, here I quote his report, a number of armed men went to Perry's house after the polls closed without a warrant and without authority of law to arrest him. When the white men approached Perry's property, apparently two of them were shot and injured, including Orlando's former police chief who was shot in the arm. The nation was riveted as the story unfolded. Newspapers from as far away as New York quickly reported the events that followed. White, quote, reinforcements began to arrive. Men from nearby Crown Point and Winter Garden, and according to one report, quote, 50 carloads of men from Orlando. Their purpose, as described by a Jacksonville paper, was to, quote, help preserve Order. Here, the New York Dispatch on November 2nd described the scene as, quote, a bloody battle. It reported, quote, the colored men engaged in the battle are barricaded in the house of July Perry, and their dead and wounded cannot be gotten to. The white forces are said to be fighting at a great disadvantage to dislodge the colored forces. Of course, this was a preposterous claim, given that Perry and the men with him were surrounded and trapped. In the same newspaper, an update on November 3rd reported that the fighting was continuing and repeated that, quote, the Negroes are heavily armed with every advantage in their favor. Once the violence subsided, the dispatch reported that a total of six people had been killed, two African-American and four white, but Ackerman disagreed. In his report, he said, quote, for two or three days, the community ran riot. I children occupying the house and thus learned to death. And relocated to nearby towns including Orlando, Apopka, and Zellwood. The African-American community in Okoy 
was eradicated. And apparently the town remained all white for another 40 years. Southern African American women were not the only women denied the right to vote after the 19th Amendment was enacted. For diverse women in substantial numbers, in particular women of color and poor women, the 19th Amendment did not secure their participation at the polls. Disfranchisement of women among communities of color apparently was not unusual in the Southwest and West. Historian Cynthia Orozco concluded that, quote, Mexico Tejanas remained outside of electoral politics in the 1920s and in most of Texas for the 1930s as well. Activist Eddie Dar from Austin recalled the disenfranchising effect of poll taxes on Mexican American women and men in the 1940s. Quote, to the working people, the ones that had to pick cotton and all that, $1.75 was quite a bit of money. And for two people in a marriage, a husband and wife, to come up with three fifty dollars or what have you, that was money, you know. It was a big hindrance, no question about it. Historian Thomas Guglielmo documented how Texas excluded Mexican Americans in the 1940s from the state's white primaries. In some states, Exclusionary politics may have dated back to the territorial period. Arizona granted women suffrage when it became a state in 1912, but Mexican Americans there, including women, still were largely barred from voting. Idaho enfranchised women in 1896, but specifically excluded persons of Chinese descent. California did not formally enfranchise American born persons of Chinese descent until 1926. Oregon until 1927. Voting rights for immigrants from Asia was a non-starter. By 1926, every state required voters to be U.S. citizens, and Chinese immigrants were barred from naturalizing until 1943, and Japanese until 1952. U.S.-born women who married foreign nationals after 1907 lost their American citizenship and even after passage of the Cable Act in 1922, these women had to naturalize to regain their U.S. citizenship and access to the ballot. Class and marital status mattered too. 15 states in the 1920s required poll taxes or permitted municipalities to levy them. In an era in which few women enjoyed financial autonomy, any woman who lacked an independent income might find herself disenfranchised. In households in which men controlled the family finances, women could not vote unless their husbands agreed to pay the tax. Field organizers from the League of Women Voters found in the 1920s that, quote, throughout the South, white men blocked their wives from voting, one going so far as to burn his wife's poll tax receipt. The circumstances varied, but the outcome was the same. Despite the triumph of the 19th Amendment, many women, African American and otherwise, found that after 1920, they still could not vote. So what verdict does that leave us with the 19th Amendment? And how does all this history matter today? Despite its considerable shortcomings, the 19th Amendment was no failure. It brought the nation closer to universal suffrage, and it made the injustice of ongoing disenfranchisement even less defensible. It expanded opportunities for women to govern, and it changed the direction of public policy. It accorded women the status of decision makers in the public sphere, and recognized that they had the authority to help make decisions that others, including men, would have to abide. Over the next century, the 19th Amendment helped women assume a role in public affairs that would be hard to imagine without it. Women gradually turned, closed the turnout gap between the sexes, and in every presidential year since 1980, they have exceeded men in voter turnout. Female presidential candidates have become more numerous, one on the ticket this year. And let us not forget that in 2016, one of the two major parties nominated a woman as its standard bearer, a woman who won the popular vote. 
in 2020, women occupy 11 governorships in states and territories, 26 seats in the U.S. Senate, and 101 seats in the U.S. House. A century after ratification, it's clear that the 19th Amendment advanced gender equality in important ways. That said, the amendment's failures remind us that the work of democracy is never done. The questions about who exactly was enfranchised by the 19th Amendment in 1920 echo into our own day. The question of who can vote and the weight of those votes remains deeply contested today, not just in the South, but in every region of the country. In the early 20th century, disenfranchisement was accomplished mostly by imposing complicated registration requirements, limiting access to registration by closing offices or reducing their hours, by poll taxes, including cumulative poll taxes, where any unpaid taxes from the previous year had to be paid before voting, white primaries, so-called literacy and understanding tests, long lines of polling places meant to discourage people from waiting, and garden variety fraud and intimidation, and ultimately violence. That was then. Today, the electorate is being reshaped, often in racially discriminatory ways, by the fallout from the U.S. Supreme Court's 2013 decision in Shelby v. Holder. Today's techniques include, but are not limited to, changing and complicated voter registration requirements, especially in the form of increasingly restrictive voter ID laws that prohibit some forms of ID that were previously acceptable for registering or voting, such as utility bills or government-issued ID cards for public housing. Techniques today include closing registration offices or shortening their hours or otherwise making it difficult to register voters. In Alabama, 31 driver's license bureaus closed after 2015, most of them in rural counties with large black populations in places without public transportation. About a third of the counties in Texas, many of which are heavily minority, have no driver's license bureau at all. Today's techniques include requiring payment of back fines and fees before a registration can be approved. These, this kind of measure was just affirmed by a federal court uh, with respect to Florida last week. Today's measures include broad-based purges of voting lists, not list maintenance, that is, removing individual names if a registrar has reason to believe that, say, a person is deceased but rather wholesale removal of broad classes of registered voters. Since 2000, the number of purged voters includes 182,000 in Florida, nearly half a million in Indiana, and nearly 2 million in Ohio. Today's techniques include gerrymandering to produce districts that pack minorities into a few districts, or crack them into so many districts that they can't elect someone from their community. Producing districts that resemble, say, the bunny ears of New York's 8th district, or the donkey in profile of California's 14th, or indeed, an entire alphabet of democratic dysfunction, seen here in this graphic from the Washington Post. Today's techniques include long lines at polling places, in particular in minority neighborhoods, due to closure of precincts. 868 precincts have closed since 2013 in areas previously covered by Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Techniques today include threats of intimidation, such as sheriffs patrolling polling places in minority neighborhoods that already have a fraught relationship with law enforcement officials. Here, bringing together at a point the concerns of the Black Lives Matter movement and voting rights. In today's inflamed environment, is election violence unthinkable? Like the disenfranchising techniques of the past, 
Many of the techniques in use today are ostensibly race blind. In theory, they apply to everyone equally, but studies consistently show that they affect different communities differently and that they work to the disadvantage of communities that are poor or non-white. The race gap in voter turnout rates is wider in states that reduced the acceptable types of forms of voter ID than in places that did not. And these revised voter ID laws reduce turnout not only by actually turning people away, but also by discouraging people from even trying. In Wisconsin, in a poll done after the 2016 election, 8% of white voters said they were deterred from voting because of the state's voter ID law. The figure for African Americans, nearly 28%. These recent examples of disenfranchisement form a new chapter in an old story. The struggle for the right to vote is not confined to the past. As we mark the 100th anniversary of the woman suffrage amendment, we should recognize that while ratification of the 19th amendment ended the quest for voting rights for some, for many others, it served as a new beginning. One more step in a long struggle for a fully inclusive democracy, a struggle that continues at the ballot box and in the streets in our own day. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I'm Andrew Hurley from the Department of History at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. And on behalf of everybody that has linked in tonight, I want to thank Dr. Gidlow for a wonderful talk. And I, and I think she has encouraged all of us to think much more broadly about uh, the uh, legacy of women's suffrage. Uh, my job tonight is to field questions from the audience, and uh, there's a little Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom interfaces. If you click that, you can type in a question uh, that will then be relayed to Dr. Gidlow. And I have to tell you, the, the questions are coming in fast and furious, so we'll see how many we can get to. But I encourage you to send them in if you've got something, and uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, the first one is, what were the factors in the 1980 election that caused that particular election to see the number of women voters exceed that of men. I don't know if that was the first presidential election where that happened, but may, uh, that's, that's the question and take Great. it away. Thank you. Such an interesting question and, and thank you uh, for that. The 1980 election was interesting in some respects because it was at a time when mobilization for passage of the ERA was at a peak. The deadline for uh, ratification of the ERA was on the horizon. Uh, the activists had until 1982 to get it passed. And so there was a great deal of organizing on the part of women's groups, which may have contributed to, uh, to the um, increased presence of women at the polls in that year. But in 1980, it was sort of the culmination of a long-term uh, set of factors. Women's turnout had been lower than men's, but it had in been increasing in every year relative to men since the 1950s. A gradual increase year by year, and it is in 1980 that it overtakes. Now, there are a number of theories floated by political historians and by political scientists as to why 1980 was this watershed year. There are other factors in addition to the mobilization of women relative to the ERA. And those include partisan considerations. Um, there were people who argued on policy grounds that the uh, policy proposals being offered by the Democrats that year were uh, policy positions that more women embraced. There was concern about cuts in social programming um, that the Reagan campaigned on in 1980. So there are some people who argued that it was policy grounds. But that, uh, that emergence of the gender gap in voting in 1980 had interesting consequences afterwards. 
it is uh, pointed to as the reason that in 1984, Democratic nominee Walter Mondale nominated Geraldine Ferraro to the ticket, the first woman to be named to a presidential ticket. Uh, his campaign was behind in the polls in the summer of uh, 1984. And in an effort to uh, you know, change the dynamic of the race, uh, some records indicate that Mondale turned to a woman candidate in the hope of increasing the gender gap that had emerged. I think we're losing you. At least I'm I'll have losing to save you. Save his second campaign. How about now? Now you're back. Okay. Yeah. So, we I think we we may have missed the last sentence. Okay. Well, it, uh, Geraldine Ferraro could not save Walter Mondale's campaign, but the gender gap was probably a reason why she was added to the ticket. Okay, we've got another question. Uh, how influential was the anti-vote for women? leading up to the ratification of the 19th Amendment? And it's a two-part question. Mm -hmm. uh, the second part is, are there any correlations or parallels between the women who opposed uh, the uh, women who opposed women's suffrage back in the uh, early 20th century and women who opposed the Equal Rights Amendment? Mm. Two terrific questions. I'm going to try to remember them both here. The political power of the anti-suffragists was considerable. Um, I mean, they had been effective because suffragists had been working for uh, passage of suffrage by state measures, for example, since the 1860s. And as was true in Missouri, there were many states that had um, suffrage measures come before their state legislatures or before the male voters of the state that were turned down repeatedly. Uh, and so, um, you know, they were, they were very influential. Uh, one historian has said that uh, anti-suffragists were characterized by suffragists as representing what they called the home, heaven, and mother party. That is, that these are women and men who argued that women's main responsibilities were in the home, not in the voting booth, and that they were motivated by religious considerations, and that they were motivated by uh, thinking about women as mothers, as maternal figures. And that brings very interesting parallels, I think, with um, the later 20th century, looking at uh, the arguments advanced by anti ERA organizers who likewise emphasized the possible consequences of the ERA for the home as they saw it, who were often organized through conservative churches and evangelical churches. That was a, a hotbed of organizing to oppose the ERA and also emphasized um, issues of maternity. Uh, many of the people who opposed the ERA came out of anti-Roe v. Wade organizing as well. So I think that there are very interesting parallels to be drawn between opposition to suffrage in the early 20th century and opposition to the ERA in the late 20th century. All right, we, I think we have time for uh, one or two more questions. If anybody else out there is, has something to ask Dr. Gidlow. Um, Here's one for you. Um, next year, we will be celebrating another uh, amendment to the Constitution that widened, purported to widen the suffrage, which was the 26th Amendment, uh, which was granted uh, the vote to those 18 to 21 years old. And one of the interesting things about your talk was talking about how uh, women's, the 19th Amendment uh, animated uh, engagement in politics among African American women in particular. Switch, switch that around. In uh, 1971, when the vote was extended to 18 to 21 year olds, was there any, what, what were the implications, if any, uh, for women's engagement in politics or uh, women's voting? Mm. Yeah, another interesting question. 
So the late 1960s and early 1970s clearly were a time of great social turbulence. Um, the Vietnam War was continuing um, and opposition to it had crystallized and was very evident, for example, in student protest and anti-draft movements. Uh, but it was also a time period in which uh, feminist organizing was uh, gaining ground and uh, coming out of the women's movement of the late 1960s, the formation of the National Organization for Women and other groups. Some of these groups pushed uh, the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, which Congress finally passed by the required supermajorities in 1972 and was then sent to the states for ratification. So both of those things are in the mix as the uh, 26th Amendment is under consideration and then ratified. So there was a, a feeling by many that it was only right to give 18 year olds the vote because 18 year olds were old enough to be drafted and were being drafted and um, sacrificing uh, themselves in service of country uh, in the war in Vietnam. And so uh, there are some who argued that this would stimulate turnout um, by youth who were now voting for the first time in places that had not made uh, 18 the age of uh, majority for uh, when people could vote. But young people up from then and up until this point now um, have the lowest turnout historically of any group, um, including young women, uh, much lower than senior citizens, uh, much lower than other demographics. So uh, like the 19th Amendment, the promise of the 26th Amendment, I think, has yet to be fulfilled even in years after, after ratification. Well, I think we're getting very close to closing time. Uh, Dr. Gidlow, thank you so much for fielding those questions. And uh, I think we will now turn it over to Emily. Hello again. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Gidlow, for that really wonderful presentation. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, and thank you again to the University of Missouri St. Louis, everybody who worked to put together tonight's program. Um, if you'll give me one moment to share my screen one more time, I want to acknowledge uh, once more. Oh my goodness, my screen sharing is paused. I'm going to resume that. I think you're all seeing my well, I'll just tell you that <laughs> it doesn't seem to be working. But I want to acknowledge once again uh, our sponsors for the Beyond the Ballot exhibit, Wells Fargo and Emerson. Thanks to all of you for tuning in this evening. If you had any trouble logging in or got in a little bit late today, um, or if you just want to rewatch the program, as I said in the intro comments, we will have this posted on YouTube. We'll try to get that up for you in the next couple days um, so that you're able to watch it. And you can also see some of our upcoming lineup if you visit our website, mohistory.org, um, or if you go to our Facebook page, the Missouri History Museum Facebook page, and look under the events, we have a regular series called STL History Live that takes place Tuesdays at 11 and Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. We also have Soldiers Memorial Chow and Chats on select Wednesdays at noon. And we also, uh, this month, have our virtual Twilight Tuesday series, um, which are coming up for the next three Tuesdays at 6 p.m. We're traveling up and down the Mississippi, um, celebrating the music uh, in cities along the river. You can find links, as I said, for all of those at mohistory.org or on our Facebook page, so be sure to check those out. Don't forget to fill out the survey that'll pop up after we close out the program. So let us know what you thought about tonight's presentation. And thank you again. Thanks to everyone at University of Missouri St. Louis. Thanks to Leah Gidlow. Thanks to all of you for tuning in and I hope you have a wonderful evening. We'll see you next time. <laughs>